Okay, so this is a short video that should cover our models on the digestive or from the digestive system. And um, this, right, is of course the sagittal head, and we have a model that has a sagittal and a coronal. And as you look at this, right, there's, we're going to use this for lymphatic and the tonsils. We're going to use it for digestive, and we're going to use it for our respiratory. Okay, so let me get a probe real quick here. I've got to point things out to you guys. I'm not make you look at me too much and what I'm doing, but okay. So here, so here with the head, right, you've got your pharyngeal tonsils. You've got your palatine tonsils, and you have your lingual tonsils, right? You have the oral cavity, you have the hard palate, the soft palate with the uvula, you have what we call the pharynx all the way down to about here, get off this, right? So from the pharynx, it goes from right about here all the way down to here. It's divided into regions, so up here above the soft palate in the posterior of the nasal cavity well, this would be the nasopharynx from the uvula to the epiglottis okay, in here would be right, the oropharynx and then from the epiglottis to the end of the larynx that would be the laryngopharynx okay so um, esophagus wouldn't be shown on here we'd use this for to ask you about areas of the larynx as well and some of the features in the nasal cavity and sinuses. So here looking at this model which we're also going to use for digestive and respiratory you and and you could for lymphatic because you've got back here right you've got the sorry get about the lighting here here are the lingual tonsils shown from this view right at the back of the tongue as we turn this, we see the right submandibula, so below the mandible, and the sublingual salivary glands here. Okay, so, um, and then, like I said, the rest of this model really focuses on the respiratory tract. So we'll, we'll save that for a different video. Okay. So again, the salivary glands are considered the your accessory glands, and in the oral cavity, we would start the digestion of carbohydrates. Now, this model is a really big one, so we're going to have to take this in pieces. We really, all we're doing here, again, is reinforcing in here, this sagittal part of the head, the same things we saw in this last model. But we could use this, right? We're still going to see oral cavity to, right, the um, oral pharynx, the nasopharynx laryngopharynx. We still see those uh, tonsils, your lingual tonsils, and your pharyngeal tonsils, and your palatine tonsils. So that's still evident. What we add here is, of course, we see where the esophagus begins now and goes all the way down. Is that lighting? I might be blocking some lighting here. So I'm sure. All right, so esophagus and from the slides, right, this is just a long continuous muscular tube, continuous with the pharynx. And it is a uh, right, stratified squamous, we know from the mucosa. We enter into the stomach through a gastroesophageal or lower es esophageal sphincter, and then we're inside the stomach. So here, as we look at the stomach, as just an enlargement in the tube, okay, we have regions like the cardiac region and the fundus and the body, and then the pylorus down here with the of course, the pyloric sphincter, right? Which we know sphincters are just widened. They're areas where the cir circular muscularis is thicker, right? You see a lot of the gastric folds or rugae, which is a unique feature to the stomach, okay? I also have, down a second, just a stomach taken from the wrong torso, again, that shows this idea of the additional layers of the muscularis. And then, of course, when you open it up, you see again the gastric folds and that are known as the rugae. 
Here, in this case, they, that's, that, that's supposed to represent the pyloric sphincter, and up here would be the um, gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay, so we have plenty of organs that just lying about in the classroom as well. All right, before we go to the rest, go into the small intestine, we want to stop and look at the accessories of liver. So here, this liver was taken from, it's hard to get this lighting right. This liver was taken from the brown man's torso. Okay, so it's very nice for showing us lobes. Big right lobe, right left lobe. So this would be in the context, okay? And then I said the caudate is always next to the inferior vena cava. And the quadrate is always going to be next to the gallbladder. So here's gallbladder here, quadrate lobe, right? And then as we look here, because we ask you guys to know the ducts, okay, if it's coming off the gallbladder, that's a cystic duct. We see a right and a left hepatic ducts. So this right here and only this would be the common, okay? And then the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct are gonna unite for the start of the bile duct, all right? So if I look at it on this model, again, this is gonna be a tough one because getting it close enough and getting lighting right. We're just gonna kinda move it in like this. All right, same, same idea, right? You're gonna see your lobes, right, right lobe, left lobe, quadrate, and quadrate under here. You're gonna see gallbladder with a cystic duct coming off of it. And of course, there's a left and a right. You just use the lobes to tell which is which. The common duct is a, common hepatic duct is a little bit longer here. And the common hepatic and the cystic become, right, the common bile duct. It's gonna lead all the way down Right, oops, I take this uh, transverse colon off. Kind of pick back up and lead, let's see if I need to turn that enough for you guys to see, and lead into the duodenum. So that green line coming down, coming into the duodenum, that's going to be the end of the common bile duct. Right? So that that we want you to know. The pancreas, oh, and we can also see the same features, let me put this aside, for a second, see the same features on this mark. Right, so this <laughs> disarticulated pancreas and kidneys, right? So paired kidneys. Back it up a little bit here. Turn this bit. Tracker. Right. So here's a posterior view of this model. Kidneys in my hands and adrenal glands, right? And so I turn it around. There's a spleen, right, in the upper left quadrant. Pancreas moving across with our pancreatic ducts shown in white, okay, and dumping into the duodenum. So here we see the entrance of a minor and major. Um, duct. Okay, so this is duodenum. Okay, and here again we see the same thing. We see a piece of the liver. Again, can't tell you probably the right lobe, but because the gallbladder tends to be in the right lobe. Into the cystic duct coming off of it. So down here. Here's a probably right and left hepatic ducts. So the common hepatic duct is real evident on this model. And as the common hepatic duct unites with the cystic duct, Right, we get a bile duct. And this will continue all the way down and you see it picking up in here to also dump into the duodenum. And of course, in, in lecture, you've learned that, that the gallbladder contracts in response to parasympathetic impulses and the release of cholecystokinin right, by cells in here. All right, so that's again, these are, this is looking really closely at our accessories. Um, To understand the small intestine, before we go through all the features of this, right, you have this model, okay? So this model is a microscopic small intestine with villi, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five. Now villi would all look the same inside and outside, but they have changed the appearance so they can stress different things, okay? So this kind of stresses the, the musculature that causes the folds here in the neural tissue. This stresses more of the capillary beds, and this stresses the capillary, the arterioles and venules, as well as the lymphatic capillaries known as the lacteals. All right. What's nice about this is again you see a very well-defined mucosa muscularis. So everything from here to here in my fingers, that's a mucosa. And then the submucosa is defined from the muscularis to that mucosa muscularis. So the submucosa is between two muscle groups, right? 
And of course, you know the submucosa is going to have your glands, a lot of your blood vessels in it, and even your Peyer's patches or lymphatic nodules. All right, over here on this model, this is what I was talking about in lecture. These are duodenal or Brunner's glands, and they would, of course, only be found in the duodenum, and they would make a lot of alkaline, right, very high pH, um, or not very high pH, but a neutral pH, more, more neutral, 7 to 8, for neutralizing chyme. And then this feature, the Peyer's patch, would be found more, they, you, we, these would increase as you go towards the ileum. Then you see, of course, all the lymphatic vessels coming out and the blood vessels moving, right, to take nutrients away because you, you've done all this absorption from what was out here. Now it's in the vasculature, all right? So here your muscularis in most of the tract is two layers, right? There are circular, inner, inner layer circular, and this is where the sphincters come from, so from here to here. That's a circularis, and then a longitudinal. You see it running that way. So that runs the length of the tube, this encircles the tube. So I get mixing when this contracts, I get propulsion really when this contracts. And the yellow is showing you all the, the neural tissue that helps tell the muscle what to do. And then lastly, you see the serosa down here, right, in layers here, some simple squamous um, and some loose um, areola connective tissue, okay? So these cells are all simple columna like you learned in AMP1, and then the blue dots are supposed to be goblet cells. All right, so if you go back to this model, right, you pick up with that duodenum by going from the stomach through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum. The duodenum is the shortest part, but we really can't tell where it ends and where the jejuna begins. Um, the duodenum, you're always gonna tell because it has all these ducts coming into it. And, um, and we also have the features inside the tubes called the plaque, plaque or plaque, or plaque circularis. And these are folds similar in nature to the, they're big folds, in other words, to the rugae, but these do do different things. They really create a situation where it slows down food in the small intestine. And so the small intestine begins with the duodenum, goes through, becomes a jejunum, right? Absorption takes place, absorption, absorption. And then we get down finally to, right, the ileum. And I know we're in the ileum here because we're gonna lead into here. This now is that ileocecal sphincter that we said responds to the gastroileo effect, or reflex, excuse me. And then we're in the cecum. The cecum is fairly short. It's the first part, and of course the appendix comes off the cecum. So I just need this appendix in red. Okay. So cecum, then to the ascending colon, there's a hepatic flexure. You don't have to know that, but that's what they call that. And the transverse, there's a splenic flexure and then the descending, and then as it starts to curve, the sigmoidal, because that means S-shaped, so a sigmoidal S. All right, so from about here, down to here, sigmoidal hole. All right, and then of course I said that all this white appearing stuff is really the tenae coli, and this is reduced longitudinal muscle. And they have these epiploic appendages, these little fat pouches hanging off of it. Okay, so very unique. The large intestine, like so every part again has some unique features to it. The large intestine has the hostra or hostile pouches that really get created from the tenae colae, but they're all individual, like I said, kind of bunches of the, of the, of the tube. It's the tube bunched up there, all right? Um, from the sigmoidal colon, we straighten out, and so we're called the rectum. So the rectum would go from here to here. Excuse me, I've got light here. That would be a little better. Rectum from the straightening out down to here. And then we're in the anal canal. The anal canal has these long folds again, lots and lots of mucus, but you really know it because of the sphincters, right? So there's internal sphincters and external sphincters, okay, that control defecation, All right? So that <clears throat> pretty much takes us through the entire track. Um, again, reminding you here on this model, with the duodenum, you have the plicae circularis, very evident, all right? We also have a new, these new head models that give us 
the parotids, right, as well as your submandibular, excuse me, submandibular and sublingual. So parotids, right, just anterior to the ear, submandibular, sublingual, salivary glands. So that's also short there. And we're going to use whatever, right, whatever we can find that um, really demonstrates the different anatomical features. But I think this kind of really takes you through the, uh, the things that we're expecting from you on the practical.